So I thought this morning I'd uh, begin with a question. Uh, is there anything out there or an experience, a person, a subject, whatever, that makes you uncomfortable as a follower of Christ? Think, think about things that make you uncomfortable as a follower of Christ. So I'll, I'll um, prime the pump by saying, a Jehovah's Witness knocks at my door. And there's, you know, there's, a, there's maybe a range of emotions, but discomfort probably comes up. Leaf. Aliens make you... How come? Okay, so there's, it's silent on the subject. So sometimes, that's actually a really good point. Sometimes there's things in the Bible that just doesn't talk about, and we have to try and figure it out ourselves, right? Excellent. Someone else? Andrea? Believers behaving badly. Yes. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Craig. Yes. Yeah, that was, uh, that's an excellent one. I remember... Sure. He said, he said the opposite, uh, non-believers behaving really well. So that's a, a point I think Tim Keller makes, actually. One of the challenges of being a Christian in an urban environment is that often you rub shoulders with people that aren't Christians, maybe actually actively follow another faith, and yet you would say, sort of in generic terms, maybe they're acting better than your Christian friends, right? So that can, be a, that can be a challenge. Well, in the 1990s, when I was in junior high, uh, for a congregation, I grew up in a congregation of fairly stoic Mennonite brethren people, conservative evangelicals, and the thing that made us wildly uncomfortable was Pentecostals. <sighs> yeah, yeah. The, and it's funny now looking back, because it's like actually my home church, like they do all kinds of interchurch stuff, and their best friend church in town is the Pentecostal church, right? But at the time, it was like, oh, they sing vineyard songs. And sometimes they raise their hands in worship. And it's not even like, you know, like the shoulder length. It's like the full arm extension. And we just, we didn't know what to do with that. That was just wildly, wildly embarrassing for a bunch of Mennonites. It's, it was like we were not wearing deodorant to church or something. But I remember, I remember particularly, looking back now, I think I could categorically label it as a revival ministry that came to town. And I don't know if it was affiliated with a particular charismatic church in my town or not, but it, all I remember is one day there was this trailer that parked in the empty lot beside our swimming pool, and uh, it kind of unfolded like travel trailers do, except instead of being like a camper, it was like a tent meeting space. So they had kind of like a canvas top to it, and there were bleachers and a little bit of a, a performance stage. And so word got out in sort of the Christian community of a small town, didn't take long, um, and and... We got curious. I think at the time I didn't realize like I was going to an evangelistic meeting, being a believer for several years already, like I probably didn't need to hear that particular message in some ways. And yet I think what got around among the teenagers and the youth group was basically that they have really good music there. You should go and hear the music. And so that's, that's really what we went for. Um, but it was funny because you kind of had to sneak out in a way. Like, I certainly didn't tell my youth pastor or my pastor that we were going to this, because it was like, oh, well, the, you, might, you might catch the Holy Spirit if you went there. Like, that was, that was the big concern, right? Um, I, I, think it, I think it was, you know, s simply this understanding that it was like, something was going on there that maybe we didn't quite understand as more conservative believers, and something was going on there that maybe wasn't controlled in the same way that we were accustomed to at our church. And I think after that, reflecting on that experience, I think, boy, I wish I should, I had taken more part in that. Like we, you know, I, I think there's a part of me that, you know, secretly wishes to be a Pentecostal. So that's why I t titled this sermon, why, why You Should Be a Pentecostal. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be pretty clear, and I, I'm going to cherry pick that experience, because I know there's probably a few in the room that have actually been to Pentecostal churches and know about it far better than I do. 
but I think what I'm getting at here is like, I don't want to switch denominations. Actually, what I want to talk about is a change that is more fundamental than that. I, I want to talk about a change that goes deeper into our Christian lives than just changing the, the nameplate on our church. I, I think what we're talking about is longing for a deeper experience of Christ and the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so I said, you know, we're, gonna, we're kind of going through the bones of belief here. We're talking about sort of our, the structure of our faith. But today, I want to maybe take a little bit of a tangent and say, what is our experience of this doctrine? I mean, we can talk about all the technicalities and, and check all our boxes on, on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. But what does our experience tell us? And the question that comes to me, you know, as I was studying this week is, is this. Have you and I settled into a kind of spirituality that's kind of drab? A spirituality that, that doesn't expect much of God. That is, that is content with um, going through the forms without necessarily experiencing the power. I, first quote I have on your uh, study page there, if you're following, is from William Carey, a, a famous... Um, missionary was sort of one of the, the forefathers of the Protestant uh, faith missions movement. He said this, great, expect great things of God, attempt great things for God. And especially you look at that whole generation of, of sort of these first missionaries that kind of had to reinvent the wheel in some ways in terms of faith missions, uh, just realizing there's a whole wide world out there and God is powerful enough for us to do what is seemingly impossible. And, and I like that spirit in saying the same, that same spirit is at work in us. And I think that's what, what I, I think appeals to me about this term Pentecostalism, is we, we get down to its roots, and I, I think it's fitting we're doing Acts with our quizzers uh, this year. We, we read the book of Acts, and, and I think at its heart, the movement of Pentecostalism reads the book of Acts and says, fundamentally, the same Holy Spirit that indwelt those believers, the apostles that came down like tongues of fire, that spoke powerfully, that, that motivated the apostles to do wine, signs and wonders, wines and sunders, uh, <laughs> that same Holy Spirit is at work in us. And we acknowledge there's no fundamental difference between us and them. And that's a pretty f powerful admission. I, I think in our own spirituality, I think we're... We're content with good things in a lot of ways. You know, faith, perseverance, faithfulness. Th these are all good. You know, as we work through hard times in our lives. So, you know, uh, St. John of the Cross talks about the dark night of the soul. And some of us have been through that. Times where, where our faith seems dry. And it's difficult to follow God. These are all good things. To, 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 to be content in our walk with God, but they sh I don't think they should rob us of a sense of expectancy that God is still doing his work, that God is still regenerating sinners, that God is still calling us as believers to follow him and, and to hear his voice clearly spoken through his people and through his word. Paul gets at this in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, chapter 14, verse 1, after he's had this long discourse on, um, on spiritual gifts and then on love, which sort of like makes them bloom. And then he summarizes those two teachings this way. He says in one sentence, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the spirit, especially prophecy. So he says, you know, don't throw, don't throw love out in the midst of trying to be useful. He says, no, that's, that's the, like the, the blanket condition of your Christian experience. But desire the gifts. You know, uh, he ends chapter 12 by saying, de desire the greater spiritual gifts. Like, go deeper in your usefulness and your walk and your spirituality with Christ. And so I think that is really what our whole statement is about as we talk about the Holy Spirit is God's empowering presence in us to see the gospel acted out in our lives, that, that, it, that it comes with flesh on it. And that's what the, the Holy Spirit does. I mean, again, you know, we had that kind of useful overview, I think, of what the Holy Spirit does all throughout Scripture. But one of the key things that keeps coming up again and again through the Holy talk of the Holy Spirit is that it, he is powerful. 
He's powerful. Sometimes we forget that, don't we? You know, we, we, we want to live the Christian life, but we've kind of forgot the gas to fill the gas tank. And that's, that's the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. Not that I'm saying he's an impersonal sort of force out there somewhere. He's very much a, a member of the Godhead. But let's read the, the statement at least so we get that in our heads a bit. So our tie-in with the gospel is saying this, God's gospel is applied by the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, I, I heard one author describe courage as the virtue that, that allows you to put every other virtue or character quality into action at the point that it is needed. And so in that sense, God's Holy Spirit is what allows us to put the gospel into action at the point where it is needed. But here's the statement. We believe that the Holy Spirit, in all that he does, glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. He convicts the world of its guilt. He regenerates sinners. And in him, they are baptized into union with Christ and adopted as heirs in the family of God. He also indwells, illuminates, guides, equips, illuminates. Yeah, like lights things up, particularly, particularly the Bible. Oh, that, yeah, that would be something different. <laughs> All right. He illuminates, guides, equips, and empowers believers for Christ-like living and service. So we, we read all of that, and I think there's an expectancy that God is going to do something. But again, it's funny, you know, I think what I've, you know, I talked at the beginning about fears, right? And I think that's maybe part of the equation. I think at the, the end of the day, you know, as a quiet, growing up in a quiet, conservative, evangelical church, I think at the end of the day was that if we left the Holy Spirit out in some ways, we we had a nice box for our Christian experience, didn't we? We could, we could expect what was going to happen. We, we kind of understood what the path was in front of us. But I think our, our deep-seated fear was that if I really yield to the Holy Spirit, if I radically submit to his power in my life, anything could happen. Anything could happen. And the funny thing is, is like, I want what's on the other side of that submission, for sure. Like, I want to be more expressive in, in, in worship. And, I, you know, we kind of had a chuckle this morning. You know, I said, you know, we're not, maybe not a terribly demonstrative church uh, in terms of worship. But, but I think that's maybe, maybe a signpost along the way into, into a deeper experience of the Holy Spirit. I want to submit to a higher power in my life in some way. Like, I don't... You know, as much as I want to be directed into whatever avenue the Holy Spirit leads me, and that might be pastoring a small church in a, in a quiet town in, in northern Alberta, I want, I want to do that with power. I don't want to just do that, well, ho-hum, I'm going to, you know, settle in for the long haul here. I want the Holy Spirit to enable me in that. I want the same kind of experience as the church had in Acts chapter 2 with the coming of the Holy Spirit, with Pentecost. And so in that way, that's where I'm going to cherry pick and say, yeah, I want to be a Pentecostal. I want that same experience, except I don't think I want to recreate it. I think I want it better. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to be like Elisha coming after Elijah and say, I want to be like this, but give me, you know, let's just round figures. I want twice the power that Elijah had, right? Um, I, I, want, I want something more than that. And if I, if I can, you know, cherry pick even more, I, I'd say, well, you know, the early church, like, yeah, let's, sure, let's have the power, but let's avoid the mess. Like, <laughs> I was reading from 1 Corinthians before. It's like, read the books to Corinthians. Like, the early church was, yeah, it was on fire, but that was mo both literal and figurative sometimes, right? Like, it, you know, there was problems that came with it. But I think, again, you know, maybe that's what we need. Maybe we need some of the mess. Uh, P Pastor Rick Warren of, you know, Saddleback Community Church down in the state's largest evangelical church in America. Um, his life verse as a pastor comes from Proverbs that basically, if I can paraphrase it, it says like, you know, there's a lot of power that comes with a pair of oxen, but where the barn is empty, i.e. clean, no work gets done. And so <laughs> his 
his paraphrase into church work was like, if you want a pastor, you're going to need a shovel at some point. Like you got to muck out the barn too. You can't just enjoy the, the power that comes with that. And I think that's maybe some of our fear with the Holy Spirit is like, if I really let him loose, there's going to be a mess in my life. If I really let him have his way, it might lead to profound changes in my life. And that kind of frightens me. And that should frighten us. You know, I was just reading with um, our kids this morning. We started on Acts chapter 5 since we're, we had our quiz meet yesterday. We're on to our new chapter. Holy Spirit strikes two people dead in that chapter. Like that's, yeah, that's kind of crazy, right? Like, don't lie in church is kind of the moral of the story, right? <laughs> it's, it's pretty wild. And we should, there should be sort of some hesitancy. Like, I think there's a rightful place to say that's, this, this could happen. You know, we, I, I love um, Annie Dillard. You know, she says, uh, you know, I, I go to, she's out in Oregon. She says, I go to this little country church and, and it's grannies with their knitting and we have a little potluck after supper. And that immediately kind of, oh yeah, no, I know that experience. Um, we, they have potluck after their service. And she says, and it's wonderful. Like everything there is good. It's wonderful fellowship, encouragement. She says, but there's something missing. She says that, you know, it's like, this is, she just says, this is how we envision worship. It's very staid, very stoic. And she says, but you read the Bible and it's like, read the creation week. And it's, and it's, it's a flame with images. And she says like, yeah, we can have our pot. Like, maybe we should fire off some cannons too. Like, you know, some explosions, some fireworks to celebrate our great God and, and the power that is in, it, at work in us. And that's some of the message I think of the Holy Spirit is, is that he, he ought to make a mess. He ought to upset the apple cart in our lives. If he's not, then, then we should ask some questions. And, and I, I think I'm in the right place in saying that because like actually even denominationally, that's where we got our start. So uh, the Evangelical Free Church draws its historic roots from the Scandinavian Free Church, especially in um, Sweden and Denmark. And what happened around that time, uh, around the late 1700s, early 1800s, is something that's uh, referred to as the Reader's uh, Revival. And all it basically was, was you could go to church on Sunday, but then it it was small groups. Like it was the advents of small groups before they became popular in like the eighties or nineties. Right. But they would form little readers groups with particularly without their pastor. That was important. Um, they would just get together in small groups and homes and start reading the Bible together, like seriously studying it for themselves. And, and the realization they were coming to is they could go through all the forms of Christianity on Sunday and come away from that experience entirely unchanged. And that was kind of the idea at the time, actually, in Denmark and Sweden, was like going to church was kind of like paying your taxes. Like it was just something that you did because you lived there. You were a part of the community. And in fact, your pastor might approach his job kind of like being the mayor. <laughs> like, okay, I've been selected to do hold this office, and I have certain duties that I will fulfill. And a lot of pastors uh, at that time were actually quite candid about not actually believing the words of the Bible. And so, of course, this then created space for this revival that took place. But at its heart, it was just simply saying, yeah, we can, we can go through all the motions, but if the Holy Spirit doesn't interact with us personally, doesn't change our hearts, doesn't regenerate sinners, then it's kind of, kind of all lost, isn't it? So here's my question for you this morning as we uh, read this, uh, as we look at this, this doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Are you content? Are you content with where you are? W would you happily camp there for a long time? You know, for me, I, I, as I wrestle with that this week, I say, yeah, there's a big part of me that is. You know, I just, I kind of like to just keep plodding. That's my nature. You know, one foot in front of the other. Lord, give me more of the same. But I think there's maybe, although maybe a smaller part, I think it's a more vital part that says, Lord, no, don't just, don't just repeat what I've known before. I want a new experience of you. 
And, and I think it's easy to be content because that's what we see around us a lot of the time, isn't it? You know, people kind of plodding along, content with things being the same. And, and we think of, you know, maybe a radical submission to the Holy Spirit as, as sort of like a supernatural experience of Christianity that's reserved for the select few. You know, and I think that gets us back to how we read Acts. Is this just the story of something that happened 2,000 years ago and is destined never to come again? Or is this a real possibility in my life? I found this quote from A.W. Tozer. He says, The spirit-filled life is not a special deluxe edition of Christianity. It is part and parcel of the total plan of God for his people. I'm wondering if any of our quizzers can uh, quote Acts chapter 2, verse 17 for me this morning. Can I put anybody on the spot? I'll give you the mic or not, whichever. 217. James, good man, stand up, say it loud. Excellent. Thank you, James. So in Peter's understanding there, he begins, he says, in the last days, he meant like today as he was speaking, you know, 2,000 years ago. That, that was the beginning of the last days for him. And, and I think we read that and we like to key in on the bit about sons and daughters and young men. It's like, okay, yeah. We're very aspirational for the next generation, aren't we? Like I, I definitely, for my kids, I really hope that my spirituality, like the ceiling of my spirituality is the ground floor for theirs, right? That they can stand on the shoulders of their parents and, and get something out of the Christian heritage that they have. But I like that line, your old men will dream dreams as well. And, you know, the NIV didn't quite get to including old women in there as well, but we'll, we'll throw them under the bus. Old people, what are your dreams? What's, it, what's your aspiration for the years you have left in your following of Christ? And by old people, I'm going to say like anybody over 20 here, because that's, that's, I'm just going to blanket that out there. I, I, was, I, remember, I was listening to my, um, the service, my ordination service uh, a while back, and uh, Tabitha's dad was preaching for it. And, and I'm a youth pastor. I think I was like 26 or 27. And he says, now I, he says, I'm preaching from Timothy here, speaking to you as an older pastor to a younger pastor. But I'm cognizant that you are a pastor to teenagers who, to them, you, are, you have so long crested the hill and are so far down the other side as to be virtually invisible at this point. So old men, old women, that might be a relative term, right? But what are your dreams? Do we even have dreams, right? Or are we just so comfortable in where we are right now that we're, Lord, you know, we want the Holy Spirit, but not too much. Like, let's not get carried away here, Lord. Um, things, things are in a pretty good rut. Are we willing to be shaken out of that? I was reminded... Um, Earlier this spring, the the uh, leadership team had me set some goals, uh, talking, thinking a little bit about like one year plan, five year plan. What? And and I looked at those this week, and I thought, okay, these are these are reasonable. Like these, what's the what's the um, there's a term out there in the business world, B BHAG, BHAG. Big, hairy, audacious goals. Some of you have heard this before. No. So the idea is like you're supposed to set goals, but it's like they're supposed to be kind of achievable, but it's supposed to be a stretch. I think I, think I heard that word in there, right? And I'm looking at that, and it's like, yeah, there's, there is some of that there. But I wonder if I would write it differently if I was kind of more in that dreaming mo mode. Like, Holy Spirit, what, what do you want to do? Is it because it might be something completely different? It might be something wildly outside of my comfort zone, my personality, maybe even my gifts. There's a, another song that pops to mind from the from the '90s. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. Sometimes that's just the first step, right? Is like, Lord, I'm, 
just make me aware. Because um, life tends to crowd us in, doesn't it? Well, I, I, I like our, our statement because it gets at some of this. It, it affirms that, yes, we all as believers have the Holy Spirit. So I'm not, you know, there's some strands of Pentecostalism out there that will say, okay, well, you get the Holy Spirit when you're a believer, but then there's a second experience that you have to have later. I don't think that's how it works. You know, I think Paul is fairly clear, especially in Romans, is like, if you, if you are in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, full stop. You have the full Holy Spirit. But Paul also says some other things. Ephesians uh, chapter 5, he says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. He says, Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he's speaking to believers here. So he says, You've got the Holy Spirit, but now he says, Be filled. And I like that metaphor. He says, You know, of it's comparing it with drinking a lot of wine. It's like, Well, what's controlling you? You know, as a drunk is controlled by their liquor, so he says, we ought to be controlled by the Holy Spirit as Christians. So what are we letting control us? Or maybe, to ask it another way, what's getting in the way? What's blocking the Holy Spirit's control in our lives? You know, often I think it's the messages we tell ourselves. It's like, oh, I couldn't do that. You know, I'm not, I'm not a super apostle. Um, oh, I, Lord's not calling me to that. I, you know, I haven't had that level of education. Lord's not calling me to that. I don't have those gifts or time or money, whatever it is. And yet when we radically submit ourselves to God, I think amazing things can happen. And I, I referred to sort of our long distant, uh, history in the evangelical free church. I was talking this week with the leadership team and uh, the story came to mind of actually the first evangelical free church in Canada. And I think it's fitting to read uh, here. So I'm going to crack open um, a a volume by my, my, not my namesake, but maybe distant relative, Dr. Calvin Hansen. It's even spelt correctly. I always thought he had an E. I thought it was S-E-N, but I was wrong. So anyway... No, no actual relation as far as I know, but I'll throw that in there. So, so our first evangelical free church in Canada is in a little town in southern Alberta called Enchant. And if you've never heard of it, there's a good reason for that. It's like all these little prairie towns that were going to be big one day and, you know, are all kind of in decline now. We're, I was talking with somebody about, oh, I think it was Craig, about, you know, three, four hundred people. And they're just kind of clinging to life. And this is, this is where we got our start as an evangelical free church. When the evangelical free church of Canada, well, I'll skip this. Okay, Enchant, it's this little town, was not only the place where it all began, but the place which served as the hub from which the early missionary activity radiated. One of the early pastors in the free church who was also converted there, Carl Fosmark, would become what would be thought of as the father of the Evangelical Free Church of Canada and would serve in one capacity or another for over 60 years. He often was known to go down to the Evangelical Free Church of America and, well, we say recruit. I think the Americans would probably say poach uh, gifted ministers to come up in these new, uh, to, to work in these uh, new found, um, newly founded congregations. In terms of place and chant, the beginning of the EFCC was not was unpromising and without natural attraction. <laughs> I loved. Re- I got to read this book actually. Um, I don't know. It was probably about five or six years after I had the opportunity to actually go to Enchant. So um, my Bible school that I attended was not an evangelical free church Bible school, but we were kind of connected, familiar to this this church. And I showed up there as part of a drama team on like a Tuesday night, and it was dead people. Like it was there, like, you know, imagine your prototypical country church, you know, one room, uh, you come in and there's the pastor study on the one side and the bathroom on the other, and it's all like everything is wood that you see, the benches, the floor, the seat, everything's wood. Um, you all know the building. And we, we come in and it's like, yeah, it's midweek. I think there's maybe 20 or 30 people that show up to, you know, um, 
assuage our, our conscience or our, our egos, right, to, that we're going to perform for these people. But then I'm reading the history afterwards. It's like this is just any like any other little country church anywhere out on the prairies. But you, they really birthed a movement. Like they sent out probably a dozen pastors in the first 20 years of their life to plant churches in different congregations in different little towns around the prairies, missionaries overseas. There's probably 25 in the first, I don't know, 50 years of their life. Like that's every two years almost they're sending out missionaries to to work overseas. This is a very fruitful and productive little church that kind of looks on the surface like everything else, right? Like every other little church on the prairies, but incredibly, incredibly meaningful. Our free, our our denomination in Canada would not exist today in the manner that it does if it weren't for this one little church that could, in a sense. And I thought that was a powerful lesson as we think about allowing the Holy Spirit to guide us. You know, those missionaries, well, and especially the past, the pastors that, um, like, we would not send those people out today. I can say that quite candidly. The pastors that they sent out to, to plant churches in little rural Alberta towns like no education, you know, it was just people is like, hey, we need somebody, we need somebody to plant a church in this town. And there's, there's no church, like it's not like you're coming in and there's a landing pad. It's like you're going to go and you're going to convert people. It's like, hey, who's, who feels the Holy Spirit tugging on their heart? Because nobody had been to school at that point, right? Like there was no training for this. It was just who feels who sent, who do we sense the the spirit is empowering for this work and and work they did the the spirit moved powerfully in that congregation again uh you know acts is top of mind after this weekend chapter 4 talks about you know the you know the chief priests and the fairs, the chief priests the teachers of the law they noted that peter and john were uneducated, ordinary men, but they had been with Jesus. And for all of our excuses that we could have about, you know, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not that super charismatic person, or I haven't, I haven't had the training that I need, you know, the, uh, let me take the role of the Pharisee in this and say, yeah, but you've been with Jesus. Yeah, but you have the Holy Spirit present in you powerfully. And whether you are, eight years old or 80, God wants to use you. And so my encouragement today is let's all dream a little bit. You know, let's, our sons, all of us in this room are sons or daughters. So that kind of covers the whole gamut. And, and the prophecy of Acts 2.17 says you will prophesy. That's, to Paul, that's sort of the, the deepest spiritual gift you can get. The thing that is most helpful to the church, the, the thing where the spirit is most apparently at work in our midst. So what's your dream? What's your vision for your followership of Jesus Christ? For your churches? You know, we're gonna, that's part of our meeting, I think, that we'll be talking about as well. It's not just, okay, how do we survive, you know, a few months while our pastor is on leave, but... What's our dream for our congregation? Where do we sense the Lord leading us? How are we going to submit to the Holy Spirit in this space, in this moment, in 2023, 2024? What's that going to look like? Rather than praying to end the, the sermon and service, I thought it would be good to respond in song. That seemed like the Pentecostal thing to do. Um, I, I say that a little tongue-in-cheek, but... But if I can, if I can uh, finish reading the verse that I just started, you know, uh, Paul tells us, instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, sorry, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. I don't, I don't bring that up tritely, but to, but to say that, yeah, when we sing together, there's something powerful going on. You know, the, the psalm, the book of Psalms tells us that God inhabits the praises of his people. And so as we sing this, let's, let's sort of make this a sort of a group prayer to say, yeah, Holy Spirit, come into our lives, fill us anew. We want to, we don't want to just have you present, but on the sidelines, we want to be filled and controlled by you. And then let's dream a little bit, even if that takes us into a, 
a risky place where maybe we're not 100% in control. Let's stand and sing.